Okay, so with number six, well, number five and six, they're asking for reference angles. A reference angle is nothing more than the angle that takes you back from the horizontal to your angle, right? Or the angle to your horizontal, right? Depending on how many times around the circle you've gone, the angle that's given to you may be uh, larger than 360 or 2 pi, which is no big deal. For example, number five, we know that 180 degrees is all the way around, halfway around the circle. And you didn't quite go halfway, you went almost halfway, right? In this case, we went uh, 120 around gives us a 60 degree angle leftover space, right? And that's that reference angle. In this case, it's, uh, I mean, the math behind it would just be the horizontal minus the angle that you're at and you had to get it at 60 degrees. When we learned about reference angles, I gave you a little kind of miniature formula that went for each of the quadrants in the second, third, and fourth quadrants. Check those out. I'm not going to go back over each one of those now, but if you go back to the notes we learned on this back in the early chapter uh, 4.1, 4.2 maybe, uh, we talked about those kinds of things. In six, we went around once, almost twice, right? So if I go around, I'm, I'm going in a negative direction, so I'm not really concerned about going in a negative angle or positive angle. I am only concerned about that distance between the two of them. If I go around the circle tw uh, two full times, in terms of radian measures, how far is that? Well, what's one full revolution in radians? Two pi. Good. Two pi is the distance all the way around the circle, but we went almost two times, right? So that would be a four pi, let's just kind of, we'll do it like it is. We would have been a negative four pi if I had gone all the way around the circle two times, right? And so the question is, if I, if I didn't quite make it, then what is this distance we have right here? So I can say four pi, negative four pi minus negative 67 pi over 18. Now I can, I can work this out in my calculator, not a big deal. Some of your calculators will literally do it just like this. You can type in negative 4 pi, and you can say plus 67 pi over 18, and it's going to give you the answer. That's totally cheating, but whatever, right? Um, if you wanted to convert everything to 18s, or you could do it this way. If your calculator doesn't do all that, you could just say 4 plus, or negative 4 plus 67 over 18, right? And then you can convert that to a fraction. Your calculator, most of your calculators will do that. Right? Otherwise, we have to get a common denominator. Unfortunately, 18 is, or fortunately, 18 is the denominator, so 4 times 18 would be what we wanted to say on the top, right? So that turns out to be negative 72 over 18 plus 67 over 18. And basically what we would do is we would just say, we'd combine those two things together, and it turns out that we'd get 5, it'd be negative 5 over 18 pi. I'm going to throw my pies in there. Normally when I'm doing the math, I just understand that pi is a part of it. Part of, it's just kind of going along for the ride. In your calculator, if you throw a pi into your work on the calculator, pi is irrational and it's going to always keep your answer as a decimal. Leave that pi off because off, you know your answer is going to have something pi over something. So just leave the pi off. Do the math in the calculator. Get that fraction in the calculator if that really helps. And that will kind of how you'd be that do it that way. Um, so the answer is just 5 pi over 18. It's not going to be negative. Reference angles are always positive and they're always between 0 and 2 pi or 0 and 360. Or sorry, 0 and 90. They're never bigger than one, one angle or one quadrant. On the second page, uh, we're going we're gonna to look at number 11 through 16 just in general. How we handle these questions is sort of up to you. Uh, essentially, I need to know a couple things. Uh, the unit circle uh, absolutely would be majority of these. You can see all the angles that are here are from the unit circle, or if they're not, they're a negative version of that, and I can always add 2 pi or add 360 to the angle and put it right back into that unit circle. Uh, this is the kind of examples you are going to see on the, on the test, where it's kind of between 0 and 360 or, or 0 and 2 pi are the negative of that. The good part is that I can just add that 2 pi or um, 
360 to it and, and get it back to being something I'm used to seeing on the inner circle. So let's look at number 12 to start with. Here we have a negative 2 pi over 3. If I add 2 pi, I'm going to turn that into 6 pi over 3 first. 2 pi is always easy to convert to a fraction. It's just the top number is always double the bottom number every time, whatever, the de whatever your denominator happens to be. And so that's going to be easy. That's 4 pi over 3. If you had a copy of your unit circle, you could have just looked at the third quadrant and you're looking for that denominator. What in the third quadrant has a denominator of 3 since each quadrant only has one of the denominators, a 3, a 4, and a 6, right? Super quick. If you caught those patterns, I don't really need to do all the little math to get it down to get it to those common factors, especially when it's on the inner circle. But no big deal. So I'm going to do it a number of ways. The qua the, um, the the coordinate for this is going to be negative one half and negative square root of three over two. So I'm looking at my unit circle, or I've got this memorized, or if I can remember my left hand trick. I got it. I, I use my left hand. I didn't. I don't remember these. I just do my left hand. That's 60 degrees. It brings up the one on the left side, the, the square root of three on the right side. I know they're all over two, so that's easy for me to remember. The question is, what's the sine of this angle? We know that the sine on the unit circle is equal to the y coordinate, so that's easy enough. It's negative root three over two. What if I don't remember that? What if I can't do it that way? Well, that's okay too. I end up realizing that this is a 60 degree reference angle. I understand that because it's, a, it's a, got a 3 as my denominator, right? Uh, 3 in the unit circle, denominator of 3 is always referencing 60 degrees. 4 is always referencing 45 degrees. And uh, 6 is always going to be referencing 30 degrees. That's also a pattern that I can remember very quickly. That unit circle, the purpose of that is really to help you to kind of see all the relationships there. And if you catch a lot of these patterns, all the extra work you need to do becomes no work at all. I just see it on the inner circle. But sometimes we, have, we, we forget things. 60 degrees, all right, this is your 30, 60, 90 triangle. And here we're going to basically take the 60 and we're in the 30. We're going to label all the sides using that 30, 60, 90 rule. So this is a 1, this is a square root of 3, this is a 2. I've got to remember that these are all negative in the third quadrant. Hypotenuse is always positive in every quadrant. Remember, sine is the opposite over the hypotenuse. So if I'm looking at the triangle in this way, here's my angle, always at the origin. Opposite is negative root 3 over the hypotenuse of 2. Still gives me the same answer. Let's just kind of do some more of these because this was one of the things that on the, 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 the quiz, the test, that people tended to make the most mistakes on. Um, let's go to cotangent number 11, cotangent of 270. So if you remember on the unit circle, the, the, the quadrantal angles, the ones that end on the axis, we had to use our coordinates because our, we can't write a triangle because there is no triangle, right? This was 0, negative 1. Remember what we said, that this is your, your cosine, and this one was your sine. And for tangent, we always said you do the y divided by the x. For cotangent, that would of course be x divided by y. So that becomes really, really easy. 0 over negative 1, which is just 0. So I'm using a lot of different concepts. We, we learned in you know, a circle that the coordinates made up like this. We also learned that tangent and cotangent, this is adjacent over opposite. Remember that our our x-coordinate is always considered the adjacent, and our y-coordinate is always considered to be the opposite, in terms of opposite adjacent hypotenuse. That's a really big concept that we don't want to just kind of gloss over. If we look at, let's say, let's look at, we'll do 13, I suppose. I could draw a triangle. This is 135. Really, this would be 225. If it ends in a 5, it's a 45-degree reference angle. There's only four of them. Right, one in each quadrant, so I don't really need to think about which one that is. This is 45, this would be a 1, 1, and this would be a square root of 2, but these are both negative. Cosecant is always the hypotenuse over the opposite. It's the reciprocal of sine. And so I'm going to say 
the square root of 2 over negative 1 or just negative root 2. I could also do the coordinate. I could say square root of 2 over 2, uh, both negative square root of 2 over 2's. We know that the sine is the y coordinate. That would be, so this would be your sine. But we know that sine and cosecant are reciprocal, so I'm going to flip this over. So you'd have 2 over the square root of 2. However, remember this is a multiple choice test. You are not going to see answers that are unrationalized like that. So I need to rationalize this answer or I'm not going to I'm not going to recognize my answer on the key on my answer choices, right? So rationalize it. Turns out you can get 2 square roots of 2 over 2. That's about to do 4. All right? And they're negative. So this cancels out and you're left with negative square root of 2. Right? Either either way, I tend to like the triangle method sometimes a little bit better, especially for the ones that are like secant uh, and cosecant, because otherwise I am going to have to rationalize my answer if I use the coordinates every time. Not a big deal. I mean, rationalization, I didn't really do a whole lot of math there. I just did square root of 2 times square root of 2, which we all know is just 2, I hope. Okay? Does that make sense on those kinds of questions? You got the key. I don't want to keep doing the same thing over and over again, but... Let's go on and look at number 17. In this question, uh, this is one of the easier questions, but a lot of students didn't know what I was asking or how to, to handle the question. Um, I'm giving you a coordinate, and that coordinate is essentially I'm giving you the size of the triangle, right? So I want to draw the triangle down. The x coordinate is here, the y coordinate is there every single time. So what I'm going to do, if I want the cosine, that's going to be the adjacent over the hypotenuse. So I need to find that hypotenuse before we finish out, right? So 2 squared plus 3 squared equals 13, which is c squared. So the square root of 13 is going to be my hypotenuse. And we're just going to leave it as that value. You'll see, that you'll see your answers reflect that radical sign. It won't have a decimal. Uh, cosine is easy. It's going to be 2 over the square root of 13. Of course, we're going to have to rationalize that number. So we end up 2 root 13 over 13 as your an final answer. But when I give you the coordinate, I'm essentially giving you two sides of the triangle, the horizontal and vertical component. Once I've got those down, I can find that hypotenuse if I needed to. In fact, the, the one I put on the test last time, I didn't need to do any work. I gave you x and y, and you needed to tell me the cotangent, which was just x divided by y. That's all you had to do. I think it was like 8 divided by 12, reduce it to 2 thirds, and, and that was it. You didn't need to do any extra work on that. I want to talk about the multiple choice graphing questions. We're not going to be graphing things physically, right? Obviously, these are multiple choice questions. Uh, so it's important that I be able to, to reason out how to graph something with a multiple choice question. So if we look at these questions here, what are some of the tips I gave you about choosing these scenarios? What's the first thing we can look at? Vertical shift and amplitude are my very first two things. They're super easy to determine and they're really easy to kind of just visually see on the paper. Um, period would be the other thing I'd go to if I have to. Phase shift I, I doubt I'll ever have to go to that, right? I can, uh, but that's all. That actually is fairly frustrating to find. Um, so let's just kind of go and see if we can eliminate a possible answer choices. So which one do you think is not an answer? Well, number one, we're looking at my vertical shift is negative one. That means my midline needs to be negative one. So that one's out, that one's out. So A and B are out of the question. I didn't even look at anything else. They're just not down at negative 1, right? The midline, the middle of that graph isn't at negative 1. C and D are, what do you notice about the differences between C and D? The amplitude is different, right? The period is different. I see that C has a larger amplitude uh, and it has a larger period. It takes longer for that, that, period, that, that graph to cycle through itself, right? And so... Let's go back and look at my amplitude and see if we can determine which one of these are. My amplitude is 3. 
And so if I come down here and look, so from negative 1, which is here, I'm going to go up 3. Is that 3? What's negative 1 plus 3? It's 2, right? So I want to be able to come up to 2. Just to double check, what's negative 1 minus 3? It's negative 4. So C would definitely be the answer. This one has a much smaller amplitude. I think the amplitude here is only 2. So it goes from negative 1 up to positive 1. It goes from negative 1 down to negative 3, so amplitude is only 2 there. <coughs> so that's an easy way for us to kind of navigate through graphing questions. Let's look at A. The midline for A is halfway, right there. That's positive 1. Another way to do this, is you can take the max and the min, right? This is negative 2. You want to find the, the midpoint of those two things, right? So you can add them up and divide by 2. That would tell you where the midpoint. So 4 plus negative 2 is 2. 2 divided by 2 is positive 1, right? So if you want to add the max and the min together and divide it by 2, that's a really easy way. For, sometimes it's kind of awkward to kind of see where that midline is. You're not quite positive on that one. Um, if that is a little awkward, add max, add, or add max and min divided by 2, and that will get you mathematically how to get the, mid, the midline. If we look at cosine, Okay. Remember when you have a function that has the value for k, don't forget you can add that just to the end and look at it that way. Here we want to kind of look. So we have an amplitude of 1 half. So here's 1. That's a positive 1. So this one's out. This, how can we eliminate b? Just off the top. Like I don't even need to think about the, amp uh, the period here or the, the phase sh vertical shift. What's wrong with B? Well, I know it doesn't look right, but what about it doesn't look right? The amplitude is very large here, right? In fact, I can't even see the amplitude on the, the graph they've given me. Number one, I know it's bigger than a half, without doubt. So I, I'm not even going to bother with that one, right? So that one's off. The other two, uh, here, you can see the midline is down at negative 2. It looks like the amplitude here is just 1. Here we have a, a midline at negative 1, and it doesn't even go to, to 2, right? So the amplitude's a half, so it should be going up to 1 and a half or half. So in this case, in fact, I could get that answer just by looking at the midline, okay? It's the midline should be at negative 1. The amplitude is a half, so I expect it to be a really, really small graph, or a real small value. So that was an easy way to do that. So that's how you do sine and cosine graphically. You will be asked to do questions like this, you know, what's the amplitude period, uh, vertical shift, all those kinds of things. So on 23, what's the amplitude here? Zero. Ooh. None. None. Why? Just because I ask you for it doesn't mean it exists. Mm -hmm. Tangent, cotangent, Secant and cosecant, all of the other graphs don't have amplitude. Only, only sine and cosine have amplitude. Okay? And so what about my period? Six. Good. Pi over 6. Remember, for tangent, it's going to be just pi over b. For sine and cosine, it's 2 pi over b. What about my phase shift? There we go. Negative pi over 6 divided by 6. That'll be, that's over 1, right? So 1, 6. So it's going to be end up negative pi over 36. And of course, vertical shift, this is the easiest one, is 4. Word to the wise, you've got multiple choice questions. Let that work for your advantage. As you collect these easy pieces, for example, amplitude, vertical shift, even period, I can eliminate answer choices. I don't necessarily have to get every single piece right to find the exact answer. I may have to do that occasionally, right? But as you get an answer, look over and see which one of your answer choice. Oh, nope, that's out. Oh, that's out. Now, may, I may eliminate every answer but one before I finish, right? Keep that in mind. That's a test-taking strategy that we all can play with. Let's look at, let's look at this graph, or not this, uh, this conversion question. Number 31 is asking for us to convert um, Revolutions per minute. So we have, we're going to start out with 800 revolutions per minute. We want to end up somewhere around miles 
per hour. Okay, so somewhere along the lines, we're going to have to set up some fractions and convert those units over from revolutions all the way over into miles and hours. Well, let's get the part that we know we can do really easily. Let's get the time from minutes into hours. That's easy to do. And the order that you do this in is not necessarily rele re really relevant. So we know that we have 60 minutes. That's the same thing as one hour. Done. So now we're in revolutions per hour. But I need miles per hour. I look over here, the unit of distance that my radius or diameter is measured in is going to matter, right? So this is in inches. So somewhere I'm going to have to get over into inches. And then from inches to feet, then feet to miles. Those I can do, OK? We know that that one kind of unusual conversion unit would be uh, one, one radius is to one radian. However, we remember that this one, it's not a radius. We don't leave it as a radius. Whatever that radius is, in this case, we're going to have a decimal. It's going to be, what, 19, uh, what, 15.5 or 14.5 radians or inches. And so let's go ahead and go from revolutions to inches. Can't really get there, but I can go from revolutions to radians, right? And so we know that one revolution, one full trip around the circle is how many radians? Yes, it's two pi radians, right? And then now from there, I can get from that, I can go, I can say, well, one radian is the same thing as 29 over two. Um, that's going to be 14.5 inches because my radius is just your 29 over 2, which is your 14.5. Okay, I'm going to run out of space here. What's next? You tell me. Inches to feet. Good. So we have 12 inches is to 1 foot. What else? Feet to miles. Feet to miles. Right? That's a good question. Go on. 5,280. I won't tell you that. You should know that. But at this point, even if you didn't know it to start with, we went over it quite a few times at this point, right? 5,280. Uh, oh, wrong one. Did it the right way. I want to put the feet on the bottom. It's 5,280. Oh, I just put the wrong unit. 5,280 feet is the same thing as one mile. Let's check my units at this point. Our feet are gone, our inches are gone, our radians are gone, our revolutions are gone. We're left with a miles on the top and an hour on the bottom. Exactly what I wanted, miles per hour. And so I can go through that. I'm going to take my calculator. I'm going to multiply through on the top, just the top. So we're going to have 800 times 60 times 2 pi times 14.5. And that's going to give me a fairly large number. And then on the bottom, I'm going to see, I'm going to, I don't have a whole lot to multiply. It's just going to be 12 times 5,280. So we have 63, 360. And I'm going to divide those two things. They're still in my calculator. I can, I can go back and grab those, those answers. Save myself a little bit of time. Turns out it's about 69 miles per hour. It's actually 69.0198, if you want to get technical with it. Be careful. Um, sometimes I'll ask you to round to a specific unit or a specific value, the hundredths or tenths or whatever place. I know this is multiple choice, so you're not really going to be given options at this point. But uh, in some cases, you'll if it's Canvas thing, right? If it was digital, that and you're typing it in, that's a big deal. Like it'll count it wrong if you're outside of a certain margin of error, usually a tenth of a point off, and you, you'll make it, you'll get it wrong. And so there's number 31. So number 30, if we draw it properly, right? Whether you drew it right or left, it doesn't really matter. Here's our, our ramp is going to be here. And this is the height of the ramp. So this is 32. The, the length of your ramp 
is 470 feet long. The question we wanted to know was where does the angle go, right? And it says specifically ramp to ground, ramp, ground, ramp to ground. Okay, last time we made it, I made a similar statement. I'm writing these questions out very, very intentionally so that you can see exactly what I'm talking about. I don't want you get, to get confused about those kinds of things. And so we would say the sine of whatever my angle is is equal to the opposite divided by the hypotenuse. Well, how do we get an angle from that? We're going to use sine inverse. It's super hard to hear you guys with that mask on. That's why I get all that. That's what it sounds like. Um, so we're going to do that. There's a danger here that if I'm using trig functions and I'm in radians or degrees, I will get the wrong answer. So I want to make sure that if I have a calculator that goes back and forth between radians and degrees, if I've messed with that at all, I need to make sure I'm in degrees because that's what my answer is going to be in, right? Tenth of a degree. If you haven't really messed with it, you're going to be fine. So we're going to do sine inverse of 32 divided by 470. Turns out that our uh, incline is going to be equal to 3.9 degrees. And that, I know that seems small, but when you go up mountain roads and you have a really, sh really sharp or steep incline, those are like 10 or 12 degrees, right? So your car can't go too steep of a degree. Uh, other questions? I'm going to go back up and look at some of these, like 28 and 29. If, uh, if I know the cotangent is 4 thirds, and I want to find secant, right? So I'm just going to draw the triangle. In this example, uh, it doesn't necessarily matter how you draw the triangle, because all these side lengths are positive anyway, so I'm not really worried about the quadrants. In this case, we know cotangent is always the adjacent over the opposite. So I'm going to label those. That's going to be a, f um, I'll put my angle here. So that's important. Put your angle first, and then we're going to say that adjacent would be 4, and the opposite is going to be a 3. That makes this a 5, 3, 4, 5 right triangles. I want to know secant. Secant is the hypotenuse over the adjacent. So that makes it really easy, 5 fourths. If I don't know the, if it's not a common right triangle, then I use what to find the, the third side. Thank you. Pythagorean theorem. Thank you.